I'm Alex Nisbet, and this is The Service Design Show. In The Service Design Show, we talk to people that are shaping the service design field about the current state of the industry, exciting new developments, and challenges up ahead. Today, my guest is Alex Nisbet. Uh, some people may know Alex as he is the head of design at LiveWork. And something that you might not know uh, is that he almost became a potter, but chose graphic design instead. So it's luckily that we have him in the, in the service design field today. Welcome to the show, Alex. Hi there. Uh, you're uh, right now in the UK, right? In London. Absolutely, London Town. London Town, and uh, I see the small Livework uh, uh, logo there. Yeah, awesome. Alex, you've been in the industry for uh, 11 years, uh, you've just told me, and um, I'm really curious, what is actually your very first memory of service design? Hmm. Mark, that's a great question. Um, I think it actually goes back a little bit further than uh, 11 years um, so uh, a friend and I were, we were talking about cycling um, and we were talking about uh, sharing bikes and things like that. Uh, and we thought, um, we, were, we were both graphic designers, so we were kind of creative people um, and we were just trying to figure out how on earth, you know, could you possibly design something around sharing bicycles? Um, and this was a long time, this is, you know, before Vélib really in, in Paris uh, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and we just thought, wouldn't it be great if you could? But we just had no idea yeah. how you could do it. So I think that was probably, without me realizing it, my first, uh, my first uh, uh, thoughts about service design. And, and uh, can you recall when you actually stumbled upon uh, the term? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I was working in uh, um, uh, I interactive, uh, I guess you could call it interactive marketing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we were already thinking about the user uh, quite a lot um, and, and uh, how, how to, you know, kind of create messages for them and, and help them do what they wanted to do. Um, and somebody got in touch with me and said, hey, there's a position at a company called IDO uh, and it's about service design. Uh, I think you'd be really interested in that. <laughs> so that's where it all started. Um, Alex, let's explain uh, to the people that are listening or watching this episode how the format works, right? I've got a stack of papers with some topics, and you've also got a stack of papers, right? Yeah, there we go. And your papers uh, contain question starters. So I'll be holding up a topic, and you'll be holding up a question starter, uh, and we'll co-create the question that we're going to discuss from there on. Cool. Sounds good, right? Let's just Absolutely. jump Let's just jump in and uh, let me pick a topic that's, um, well, I'm not sure quite what it is, so I'm really curious what you'll make of this. It's called uh, customer performance. Okay, um, so, um, well, here we go. Um, do we get that? Yeah, absolutely. How can we? Um, let's, how can we design for customer perform performance? Um, so first off, I think it's probably worth uh, just thinking about what we mean by, or what I mean by customer performance. So uh, um, four years ago, I worked at the London Olympics, um, and one of the big challenges that we had was that the uh, uh, most spectators were only ever going to visit the Olympics one time, okay? So they had no kind of previous experience, uh, and they weren't going to, probably weren't going to visit again. Uh, the, the Olympics and the way that we designed it was had to be quite complex. You had to arrive very early. You had airport-style security. Uh, you had venues to navigate that you'd never, ever been to before. Um, and uh, when you sat down, uh, it was all going to be the most brilliant, you know, the greatest show on earth. Yeah. Yeah. So we realized that we really needed to help spectators to, to, if you like, get to the right place at the right time and in the right state of mind. And of course, if they did that, they were more likely to spend a little bit of money on the catering or the merchandise. But possibly more importantly, they provide that sort of perfect backdrop, if you like, mm. for the broadcasters mm. and the athletes. Um, now, in order to do that, it meant that the organization had to be high performing, if you like. So not just the, uh, the usual things like great signage uh, and uh, great information. Uh, but also thinking especially about uh, ensuring that spectators knew that they had to arrive super early, 
uh, that the games makers were on hand to help guide them to the right place, and that queues were minimized. And even if you did have a queue, it was actually a fairly okay experience. Mm. Now, this, uh, this idea of um, uh, customer performance or spectator performance that can also be applied to think about the airport. So oftentimes you're in a hurry, you don't know which way to go, the gate may be changed, uh, but you really need to get to that gate on time. And if you can do that, uh, then you're more likely to buy a coffee or maybe some last minute duty free. Uh, but especially you're going to be um, a happy passenger, if exactly. you like, a high yeah. performing passenger. Yeah. And that's what the airlines like. They mm. like us when we're flying to be happy, to be punctual. Um, but that means that the airport has got to help us get to the right place at the right time. And it works for, look, it works for hospitals. Uh, yeah. It, it work, works if you're um, uh, visiting a city for the first time uh, as a tourist. It works. So this idea of high performance uh, for a customer but the, the challenge there and how can we design for uh, high performance is really to ensure that the organizations and businesses understand the role that they play uh, in, uh, the, in the service that they provide and uh, in the um, customer or the spectator experience as well. Um, so it's a, it's a very critical thing. Uh, um, it's a big challenge. Uh, but if you do it right, um, then you get satisfied. Customers, you get uh, uh, customers that are going to come back. Uh, customers that are going to advocate uh, your service. So oh, yeah, I, I think this is really recognizable for everyone who's been uh, a customer or a spectator or a patient or a client in a situation which is pretty complex, and uh, you're there for the first time. So we all know this, and uh, I think I've never heard of the term customer performance in this kind of sense. So it's really intriguing. Um, what, what is your takeaway from the Olympics? You know, what were the main ingredients that actually created or the high, high performance customers? Uh, so I think there, was, there, were, there were two things. There was the fact that this was going to be a once in a lifetime opportunity for London, uh, but also for, for the city, for the spectators, if you like. Um, and in that respect, uh, on the, so the same time, we knew that we wouldn't get it right first time. Uh, so it's going to be hugely impactful, hugely important. But we knew that the first day, the second day, the third day, it wouldn't be perfect. Mm -hmm. So I think it's acknowledging that you're not going to get it right first time. But secondly, I think my main takeaway probably from the Olympics was that um, – um, this sense of continually improving the experience. And for us at the Olympics, that was on a daily basis. Um, not just leaving it to, till next week or next month, um, but actually refining the experience on a daily basis. And I think that's something that every service, every service uh, provider uh, can take a, take a little away from. So could you, could you say that you actually designed more of a mechanism or a process to uh, continuously improve the, the service instead of the service itself? Yeah, so that's something that I was very involved with the, at uh, Games Time. So we were, we were interviewing um, spectators as they, as they were leaving uh, Stadia. Uh, we were monitoring social media to hear what they were talking about, where their pain points were. Uh, we were observing um, their, their kind of behaviors uh, at the venues. Um, and overnight, we would uh, create, if you like, a, a set of uh, uh, scores <laughs> for each, uh, each venue um, on the how they were performing on, I don't know, speed of queues or how efficient security was or um, how, how spectators felt about the, 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 the quality and the value for money of food and drink or things like that or the quality of the sports presentation. So all these things we were measuring on a daily basis. Almost real-time monitoring of service. Quality, service Absolutely. experience, real, wow. Yeah, real time. And then feeding that back to the venue teams and the sport teams so they understood where they had to improve. And what was the biggest challenge in that if you look back on this experience? If you could pick <laughs> one. <laughs> um, am I allowed to say lack of money? Um, hmm. This is an interesting case where the, uh, so London was the first um, uh, host city, if you like, to to really explicitly design with spectators in mind. 
clearly there have been spectators a long time before that, but we were the first city to actually have a spectator experience team. Um, and that, but that meant that uh, they didn't quite understand how to use us. Uh, and we really had to build a very, very strong business case and fight, uh, fight for the funding to do what we were doing. Because back in 2012, you know, we were only just really coming out of quite a bad sort of financial crisis, really here uh, in, in London. So, in very much, it was very much an austerity game. So, as as sort of creative thinkers, if you like, we had to be quite resourceful in, in how we used uh, how we used the funding that that we that, that we needed. Uh, but once we did put uh, mitigations in place. Uh, the organisers immediately saw the the value that uh, we were bringing. So, once you make things tangible, often that's when um, organisations that's their that's their aha mm. moment. Uh, mm. I guess mm. if you like. And have you seen um, uh, any other field or sector taking learnings from from what you've learned at the Olympics? Yeah. So. Um, some of the uh, interestingly, some of the uh, uh, the airports, uh, the um, uh, train um, you know train providers yeah. uh, are beginning to, to to think in that way. Uh, but they also, I'd say, the City of London um, has taken uh, uh, a leaf out of the Olympic book, mm-hmm. and certainly uh, the work that we we that Live Work have been doing with Transport for London in um, focusing on the visitor experience. So, um, hmm. so that, if you like, the experience of the Olympics has began to kind of cascade down to lots of other organisations uh, um, at home or, or, or um, um, far away. And I really like the topic because, uh, and of course, everybody's heard of uh, uh, staff uh, performance, stuff like that. But customer ex- performance, um, like I said, is quite new for me. Any, any um, tips or resources where people can learn more about uh, this topic? Um, yeah, well, uh, it's um, that's a good question, actually, uh, Mark. A very good question. Um, I think there are some people are beginning to write about it, and I think partly out of my Olympic experience. So, um, so uh, the the, <laughs> the new book by Live Work. <laughs> we'll put a link up there. Yeah. Um, so uh, we talk about that a little bit, um, and um, I'm I'm constantly talking about it. Um, but it'd be interesting. I tell you, what would be interesting to see, uh, of course, um, at the Olympics in Rio uh, later on this summer, uh, how that experience is. So I think the real proof there is to is is, is how the spectator experience uh, uh, is there. Interesting, Alex. Um, let's move on to a second topic because time is flying by. Hmm. <clears throat> this is a topic that has been on the show uh, uh, a few times already, and it's uh, capacity building. Mm-hmm. Um, so there we go. Who are, are who are? Um, let's make who are building capacity? Question mark. Right. Um, so. Uh, I think over the sort of 10 or so years I've been in service design and I'm, I still feel myself as a relative newbie, if you like, um, those, those kind of organizations that have been continually focused on building their capacity to design services um, have been those in the public sector. Um, so if you know the story about uh, teaching a man to fish. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, And it's the public sector, especially here in the UK, have always been very focused on um, developing the skills internally uh, to be able to um, uh, design, deliver and operate services. So although they've been um, um, they've been buying service design from design consultancies, they've been equally uh, focused on uh, figuring out how to do it themselves. Um, and uh, and this over now over the last few years, we've seen an in- increase in in uh, commercial organisations wanting to do exactly that same thing. Mm-hmm. So um, you know maybe um, maybe there might be a time when um, service design consultancies, and maybe that time is now. Uh, mm-hmm. That uh, if you look at the volume of services being designed globally, uh, there is a time. Maybe it's now where service design consultancies are doing that much, but then organizations are designing and delivering that much. Um, and uh, 
I think there's something about service designers. We're incredibly open. Uh, we want to share everything, um, and we want everybody to succeed uh, at this. Because um, as, uh, as somebody once said to me, there can never be too many service designers. That's a nice statement, absolutely. Um, I need to plug my computer into some power. Let's do it, yeah. <laughs> Two seconds. <laughs> So a lot, a lot of the work that we do here at Live Work uh, is not just about delivering content, if you like, um, actually sort of supporting our clients in, um, in improving uh, and innovating their services, but I'd say an equal amount of it um, is explicitly about helping them to build their, their internal capacities, their abilities, their skills uh, to be able to shall we say, not necessarily become a service designer. I don't think that that's necessarily the thing, uh, but certainly to understand what good looks like so that they can um, uh, manage uh, service design projects, if you mm -hmm. like, uh, but also how they, in their own way, can uh, improve and innovate services using many of the kind of tools and uh, techniques, the methods, the processes, if you like, that we are all familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've been saying this uh, also, and I see this development really strongly in our in our field. Maybe it's like you said, not becoming a service designer themselves, but at least uh, becoming better service design clients, uh, being able to yeah. uh, better articulate the the challenges that they are having. Yeah, yeah, we we're seeing a, a rise of the manager if you like, the people that are, those that are actually employing us or buying our services, um, these design managers have, are experienced at design themselves. Um, and so they are very able and competent uh, at uh, helping us to co-create the brief, helping us to set up the project, helping us to work with their internal teams. They understand our language. You know, often uh, there have been times, of course, where we've been uh, working with, I don't know, uh, ahead of marketing um, that kind of kind of get it but they don't quite understand exactly um, all the detail if you like so having having an advocate inside an organization like that mm. is incredibly powerful mm. so my question also Alex would be what does this mean for service design agencies because the people that uh, we employ are used to designing service and not per se being the people who actually train our clients um, that's a good question, Mark. I, I think actually, you know what, um, a lot of service designers, you know, we're, we're by, by definition, if you like, we're very empathic, we're very curious, we're very open, we're very positive. And I think those are all great attributes of um, somebody that would share, maybe teach, um, uh, share their skills. So actually, I find that a lot of service designers are naturally very good at Helping, helping our clients to kind of do better, if you like. And in many respects, uh, it's a very similar kind of skill set to uh, design research, and it's a very similar kind of skill set to um, workshop facilitation uh, in many right. ways. Right. I think we're, okay. on the whole, we're all very, very comfortable working with people uh, and understanding their real needs uh, and, and supporting them. And, I, and, and in many ways, that's, that's what building... Uh, capability is a key part of building capabilities. So if you fast forward five years and think about uh, capacity building, what do you think has changed in the next five years? Um, well, over the previous five years, we've seen a huge growth in the demand for um, capacity building inside our client organizations, um, right across every sector. Uh, the next five years, that's only going to um, only going to increase still further. Um, I think we're going to see more more trained service designers working inside organisations permanently. So being um, members of staff, if you like, uh, uh, I'm sure there will be a time when we see designers at the very highest level of organisations, maybe on the board as well. So um, I can see those all as being very positive things. I think uh, we're also going to see a huge increase in the numbers of people that would, that if they had to select a number of skills that they had, um, they would probably say that 
Um, designing services or improving services uh, was one of those. So I think there'd be more people talking about it, more people doing it. Um, and that's only going to be a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, there are, um, the, the field is uh, definitely moving in a different, in a new phase. We're, we're entering absolutely. a new era. That's absolutely my, uh, um, my gut feeling. Absolutely. I think you're absolutely right. And I think um, uh, thinking about the UK uh, and the, the uh, um, government uh, digital service, GDS. So we're putting service design um, uh, on the agenda of central government. Uh, that's been, I think, a major turning point for us here in the UK. Uh, because for many organizations, they could say, well, if it's good enough uh, for central government, uh, then it's got to be good enough for us. So I think that that has been one of those turning points, especially here in the UK. Wow. Alex, we need to move on to the, uh, mm -hmm. the third topic. And you already touched upon it a few times. Uh, so we, uh, we had a sneak preview. And the third topic is uh, about public services. Oh, um, I picked this one up. So what if... What if public services uh, uh, just kept on improving? And what if ooh, what if public services actually became better than commercially provided services? Now, wouldn't that be an interesting thing? Well, I mean, yeah. I, I was thinking about this uh, a little earlier uh, today, and I was thinking that you know what, the world doesn't actually need more chairs. It doesn't actually need more. Doesn't even need more smartphones. Uh, what the world needs and what people, you know, us citizens of the world, we, we, need, um, we need to feel safe, uh, we need to feel valued, uh, we need to feel healthy. Um, and many of those uh, 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 provisions come from what we see as the public sector. You know, us as citizens have the right, you know, to, be, to feel protected by our country. Um, to be health, to feel healthy by our, you know, our, our health services, uh, to be, to feel valued, and to have employment, and all those kinds of things. And I think that the public sector um, uh, has got, obviously, has a huge role to play in all of that. Um, and uh, I think, yes, I touched on this before. The public sector um, is increasingly looking to design approaches, and especially service design uh, approaches to help them address the huge challenges that they face in doing all those things, in keeping us healthy, in, in keeping us kind of uh, warm and uh, keeping us, um, you know, clean and, and all of that kind of stuff, supplying those utilities. Um, uh, it, it's, in, in, it's under increasing pressure to do that with the huge, certainly the huge cuts in funding uh, that we've been seeing, uh, with the aging population uh, that, we, that we have. Um, with the increasing uh, movement of uh, citizens across borders as well, which is adding huge, huge complexity for those, uh, those at local government level or, and at national government level. Um, so I think, um, I, I think uh, that uh, those in the public sector um, here in the UK and in many, many countries around the world are using service design approaches as part of their toolkit, admittedly. Of course, they're doing, using lots of other uh, uh, techniques, approaches, but they're using service design approaches very successfully uh, in order to deliver better services uh, for, 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 for less cash, effectively. They're getting very clever uh, doing that. And of course, they're doing that by designing their services around real users, real needs. So it's kind of a, a basic for us, if you like, uh, which is uh, being adopted and adapted by um, probably, you know, for citizens, the most significant provider of services that they're ever going to interact with. So what do you think is, uh, um, what is on your mind if you think about public services compared to maybe the uh, commercial services? And I really like the, the statement that what if public services actually became better than commercial services? What are the questions that pop into your mind if you think about this topic? Mm. Well, I, I think that one positive um, is that uh, I've always seen a, a lot of um, young designers, those that are graduating, if you like, with, um, with more of a passion for doing good, uh, designing better, if you like, not designing more chairs, but actually trying to tackle some of the tough challenges around health, 
aging population. So uh, I'm, I'm, um, I feel very confident, if you like, that there is a steady stream of very talented and creative designers that want to tackle those uh, challenges. Uh, I'm also very happy to see that there's a steady stream of um, uh, discourse, of conversation between the public and the private sector, sharing, uh, if you like, and uh, trying to understand how they can uh, how they can partner, how they can work better, mm. um, how they can um, collaborate uh, and learn from each other as well. Um, this is what we're seeing. And there are some organizations in the UK, so I'm thinking about the Policy Lab, UK Policy Lab, where they're reaching out to big business uh, in, in, the, in, in, uh, in the UK to get them to help um, uh, address some of those uh, challenges that, that young families have, for instance, in, um, uh, when you know, one of the partners is going back to work. So really trying to sort of address some of the, I guess, some of the social questions um, uh, that, there, that there are around. Um, and I think it's a very exciting place to be. Uh, see, at Live Work, we're very lucky, you know, um, because uh, we work in both sectors, in both public and private. So we're so that satisfies, um, I think, a lot of the designers because they feel very driven uh, to uh, address address sort of social design issues. But it also means that our clients benefit from um, the experience that we have working across. Uh, the both and uh, and, it, and if you like sort of cross fertilizing uh, in in, yeah. in a way of those experiences yeah. right yeah. I think we could do a whole episode on uh, related to public services uh, it's uh, it's and like you said service design has a strong history in the public sector so uh, we should uh, value that cherish that and uh, and uh, embrace it and um, mm. develop it even further Alex. Maybe uh, you get this question uh, a lot by young designers uh, at LiveWork or outside. People that want to get into service design, people that are maybe just graduated, uh, coming from a different sector, what would be your tip for them? Hmm. Um, okay, uh, my tip would be to um, um, <laughs> My tip. I've got lots of tips, lots and lots of tips. Like, never give up. Think positively. Um, try as hard as you can to, to get an internship uh, somewhere. I mean, those are some kind of practical things. Um, I think there are a lot of uh, um, uh, very um, talented young designers that are going, you know what, I'm just going to go out there and do something myself. I'm gonna I'm gonna collaborate with some like-minded young people. We're gonna go and find an opportunity. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, build a pop-up studio somewhere on a high street in a store that's not used, and we're just gonna we're gonna figure it out for ourselves. So I think one of the great things, possibly about um, uh, design these days, if I can say that, is uh, with the, the technology that's available to us, you don't need huge facilities. You don't even need huge funding, arguably. You can make a difference. Uh, um, I say I wouldn't say very easily, but you can make a difference on your own. Um, and I think that's uh, you know, arguably, uh, it's it's like um, say it's like musicians these days. They don't need record companies. So service design challenges don't necessarily need service design consultancies if, with a different mindset thinking about the the user, uh, thinking positively, trying to understand the challenges in a kind of holistic kind of way. These are all things that, uh, that, that we, can, we can do straight out of college as a, as a young designer, yeah. we, can, yeah. we, can, we can do that. So I'll summarize this as go out and make a difference. There we go, perfect. Alex, this is your opportunity to actually ask a question to the people that are watching this video or listening to this episode. What would you like to ask them? Um, so I'd be really interested in understanding. So here's the question, right? Um, I think service design has always talked uh, about uh, an approach, a process, if you like, and we're always talking about being user-centered. Um, we're, we're inspired by our users. Uh, we validate our ideas with our users. Is there ever going to be a time, do you think, when we're actually going to know enough 
uh, about some kind of situations. I mean, let's take a, a, an example, uh, taking a train journey. Is there ever going to be a time when, you know what, we don't need to uh, do user research? We don't need to speak to uh, users um, because we, we have enough experience, enough intuition uh, to do it ourselves. So that's my question. Hmm. Will we ever know enough? Well, well yeah. <laughs> to do it ourselves. I don't, I don't think we'll ever know enough, but yeah. Curious what people will uh, will say about this, Alex. Uh, I know it's uh, been earlier for you in the studio, so uh, thank you for uh, being here. Thank you for taking the time and giving us uh, a bit of an insight on the topics that you are currently thinking of and working on. Mark, it's been a pleasure. What are your thoughts about the topics we've just discussed with Alex? And if you have any suggestions on who you'd like to see next on the show, be sure to let us know down below in the comments. If you enjoyed this interview and like to see more service design pioneers, be sure to subscribe to our channel and check out some of the past episodes. With the Service Design Show, we help you to stay one step ahead in service design. For now, thanks for watching.